Hi, everyone. ESG is certainly a hot topic today and something that organizations are responding to because of rising regulatory requirements and board level scrutiny. I'm here to talk about ESG reporting with leading experts from a standards board and ESG consultancy. First, I'd like to introduce Matthew Rusk, head of GRI in North America. GRI is an independent international organization that helps companies take responsibility for their environmental impacts through a common language and set of metrics. And of course, consultants play a really important role in helping companies navigate ESG related commitments in a way that aligns with their business model and goals. Here to represent the consultant point of view is Mikkel Skogard from Verisk Maplecroft. Thank you both for being here today. Mikkel, let's start with you. You get to see not only the challenges that organizations are grappling with on the reporting journey, but you get to see the outcomes. What are some of the most important opportunities you see companies pursuing in ESG reporting today? Well, yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, I think it's important to understand where we are at the moment. As you alluded to earlier, we are a bit in a moving away from what we call a voluntary uh, reporting in ecosystem into a more regulated one. So many of the companies what, that we work with on a daily basis uh, are taking this time of transition to change a few things when it actually comes to reporting. And so I think the first and foremost opportunity today they are going for is what we call reporting uh, parity. I mean, the whole idea that non-financial data should be subject uh, to different sort of treatment than financial data is rather changing fast. And so many of the companies we work with are asking themselves, if non-financial matters are financially material, then why should non-financial data be treated any different than financial data? And, and it shouldn't really. So I think that comes with a great opportunity to see that moment. And companies are taking this time to improve non-financial reporting so that it is subject to the, what we call the same conditions as financial reporting, both in terms of governance, uh, process, approvals, controls, IT system, seniority of staff, management attention, even number of staff. So we can see really allocating a lot more resources and attention to it uh, uh, compared to uh, the past. And so it takes a while, but with that, there's a unique opportunity for them to get more internal engagement and a lot of awareness raisings amongst subject matter experts and data owners across the organization. The, I think the likely outcome will be an increasing integration of financial and non-financial data narrative to the point where they naturally blend. But I think that's the first opportunities companies we work with are actually uh, pursuing, which is putting a non-financial and financial reporting a bit of a parity in that sense. Uh, the second opportunity, which many of them uh, are taking advantage of, or at least are uh, pursuing is the increasing focus on their value chain, not just from a reporting point of view, but also from an understanding point of view and in both upstream as well as downstream uh, value chain and both positive as well as negative impacts and how that translates to that added value, but also to risk management and overall reporting. But ultimately, I think one of the major opportunities you're seeing as a whole for everyone, which is a huge opportunity in the EEC reporting space, and which is actually a very good one in my view, is that if you think about it historically, a lot of the EEC reporting practices have focused on uh, what we call listed companies, but the fact that we're now moving a bit into more regulated space, we see some of these reporting practices seep through to the private companies, which often in the past were not subject to the same reporting requirements, but which potentially, for example, with the CSRD in Europe are in that sense. So I think that's also a very good opportunity that companies have now in order to improve their reporting for, and that has many benefits. So I will say these are the major three opportunities we see reporting parity, a lot more focus on the value chain, as well as the reporting practices uh, going towards private enterprises, which were really uh, subject to those requirements in the past. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, a great insight. You're in Madrid, uh, Matthew's in New York, I'm recording this out of Chicago. This is a global initiative. From your perspective, when you think about maturity, do you have a perspective like, where do you see the fast moving? Where do you see regulation? Maybe you can follow on with kind of the movement you see in the markets or in the different geographies around the world? Yes. So I think what we're seeing is a bit like, I mean, there's many, many, many developments in place currently at the moment. 
Uh, and obviously every jurisdiction almost has its own reporting practices being developed and putting into place. I think um, the idea is what we see here more is that complying with all these different jurisdictional requirements is a big ask. But I think more importantly, what we see, one of the big conversation topics we're having is the differences between the jurisdictional requirements versus more global reporting trends and stakeholder expectations. And so what we see is a lot of like companies may be subject to certain reporting requirements, but rather the expectations of their stakeholders are different. And so they have to have those conversations internally. Is the regulated ES reporting to which you're subject to, is it the ceiling or is it more like uh, the floor in that sense? So I think that what we see that how they tend to navigate that discussion is going to be very interesting going forward. Yeah. Thank you, Mikkel. I think we, we know that there's an incredible amount of business benefit that can come with ESG reporting when it is aligned to business value versus just reporting for reporting's sake. And in terms of the data required to fuel reporting, Matthew, can you share a bit about the importance of the accuracy, consistency, and context of data related to ESG reporting? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Pat. Uh, so, GRI, we're a global independent standard setter that really helps bring about a global common language for impact reporting, impact on the uh, environment, society, and the economy. A real key purpose of ours is to bring about that common language and consistency to data across these different jurisdictions to be decision useful, because reporting is a means to an end. There is a lot of business benefit when a organization goes through the process of uh, stakeholder engagement and going through uh, processes to collect more data and insights about the organization's impact out on the world. So that's a, that's a key and valuable process, but it all comes back to reporting being a means to the ends and being decision useful for internal and external stakeholders. The way we do that is to continue to professionalize the reporting process beyond what's already occurred with the 11,000 plus organizations using our standards and even more seeing some kind of ESG and sustainability report uh, globally. Those numbers are even higher. As an example, I even had a conversation today with a leading university that's conducting a research project on organizations disclosing biodiversity risk, opportunity and dependencies and impacts. And they ran into an issue because that organization uh, appeared to be a leader in sustainability in their disclosures, but it was using their own methodology and way to report. So it actually wasn't comparable and decision useful. So that's really a, a key driver for why we exist and why we continue to collaborate across different jurisdictions. At CSRD, we're a co-constructor on the impact reporting pillar of that. What we do with the standards, try to aggregate principles and metrics and protocols that are determined to be thorough and rigorous. Um, and, and we do that through a multi-stakeholder process with due diligence around it to serve all these different stakeholder groups because some of those drivers are regulatory bodies and policy. So when we create that common language, it creates that consistency, uh, it allows mechanisms and the internal controls and the assurance processes to make sure that data is credible. So we are in support of the growing mandates going around for more reporting to bring it up to an elevated level like financial reporting. Um, and also the push for more assurance, which some of that legislation uh, is putting forward, but also the elevated stakeholder expectations have already driven a good amount of assurance when it comes to that data. Support the endeavors to make sure it's credible and consistent data also by working with partners, sometimes that service providers, the corporates themselves, but also key partners that help create the uh, software tools and systems that create those uh, processes that allow that data to be tracked, uh, have the appropriate data owners, and aggregate uh, things to produce uh, disclosures and reports that, once again, are valuable and decision useful for internal and external stakeholders. Yeah, I think those are great points. I think when you think about reporting a number or a metric, understanding where that data came from, the lineage of it, how was that indicator calculated, the consistency of that, across maybe different standards and different industries, et cetera. It is a really complex topic. And if companies try to solve it on their own versus leveraging what GRI produces or leveraging you know, the insights that uh, Verisk and Maplecroft have across this, we end up with a bunch of different answers that 
aren't based in reality that maybe are subject to personal interpretation versus a standardization. And the standardization and the consistency around this is what can lift public and private companies universally versus each of them figuring not on this own. So it's, it's great to have you both here to share those thoughts and those insights. Mikkel, I want to go back to something you talked about, materiality, non-material insights and impacts in the organization. We have a lot of data practitioners on here, uh, data management folks that may or may not be familiar with that concept related to reporting inside of their organizations. Can you expand on that a little bit for the audience? Yeah, sure. So I think maturity assessments are typically a tool that is being used to understand and therefore get to a conclusion of what are the typical non-financial issues that may be not just relevant, but potentially material for the company. And by material, we have other two, two ways of measuring it. It's either material for the bottom line, it has a potential financial impact but also has a, a, what we call an outward impact. You have an impact on society or on the environment. And so it's a process that you go through systematically to understand which of, I say, a basket of ESG or non-financial issues that you now think are the most material. I wanted the highest impact, both internal impact financially, but also external impact. And typically that is done through a, a process that has a methodology to it, which typically involves quantification of, of risks, but also a lot of qualitative elements. So it's a bit of a half art, half science to it. And that sense, there's no script. And um, so you're just gonna have to figure it out um, a bit by trying. You're not gonna get it right the first year, so it's about trying. I think one of the things that is most important is that these maturity assessments, when they conduct it, they are predominantly historically being conducted for reporting purposes to decide what what information goes to a report. But more and more, they should also be conducted with a dual outcome to feed into other areas of the business, like the strategic discussion, setting KPIs, engaging management, internal communications, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a wide variety of outcomes of it that should be used, not just for reporting purposes, but for other purposes as well. But ultimately here, at least in the beginning where maternity assessment, we feel is just as much about the process that it's about the outcome. So if you get the process right, and there's a logic and there's a method to how you reach those conclusions, the outcome is what it is. So I think those are the ones I would stress here in, in terms of how or how to conduct a bit of a maternity assessment. That's very helpful. Ma Matthew, from your perspective, how do you see that materializing inside of organizations? The actually just updated our universal standards uh, in 2021. And with that, our guidance on materiality assessments. And three of the four steps to produce a sustainability VSC report, three of them are on an ongoing basis. And that's to identify and uh, assess impacts that the organization has on the economy, environment, and society. So the first one is understanding the organization's context. And if we do have a sector standard uh, that is published, which we're doing that on an ongoing basis, that can help an organization do that assessment. The second is identify actual and potential impacts. And this is in conjunction with engaging with relevant stakeholders and experts. The third is assessing the significance of the impacts. And then you get to the bucket where you're actually prioritizing the significant impacts for reporting. So it, it goes back to this idea that reporting is not for reporting's sake. It is to really understand the organization's context, its potential and actual impacts, what um, your stakeholders and relevant experts are telling you about those impacts, and then prioritizing using the resources you have at hand to produce a report to enable decision useful information to your internal and external stakeholders. So you see that process now uh, living out in organizations. And um, it, when they go through that process, uh, it really becomes valuable to the organization. Uh, and that want more accountability and transparency from organizations, and also want that information to be consistent, credible, and decision useful. Yeah. What, what I, I think for our, this, con this part of the conversation, what's been really insightful is, you know, learning about how ESG reporting is impacting not just you know, the feel good part of this, but actually the materiality part of it. And I think Matthew, what you just talked about is it's gone from a point in time to an always on concept. Like I need to be able to be capturing, gathering and reporting on this information on a, on a much different kind of timeline than maybe organizations have been thinking about that traditionally. Um, bringing us to our final question for you both, given what we know about the opportunities and the data requirements for successful ESG initiatives, 
What advice would you have for those data leaders and those practitioners and those people that are involved in these processes here today? Mikkel, we'll start with you. Well, thank you. Um, I think a few things, actually. First of all, I, I'm going to go back to my earlier point that I made. I think my first advice would be try to treat non-financial data the same way you would financial data. Obviously, many different companies are at different stages of their EEC reporting adoption curve, and nobody expects you to go from zero to hero, but try to put the same governance system into place, automatize the data collection, have bring in some seniority to the function of EEC reporting, et cetera. So I think that would be my first advice. Uh, also, try to um, don't just collect data for the sake of collecting data. I think often in our experiences, often the best data and the highest quality of data is the one that is collected irrespective of the reporting. Your reporting just happens to be the end point in that sense. So often when you do collect data, analyze it and use, make it use for internal uh, purposes. And there's two more things which I, I would also advise. Begin your discussions internally around metrality testing for non-financial risks and opportunities. Because there's a lot of confusion around, is it double metrality, is it impact metrality, is it financial metrality, which one is it? And financial metrality may be easier to measure, but what about non-financial metrality? How do you how do you make the test? How is something regard material or potentially material? That's and so those discussions need to be had. I think that's very important. Where to draw the metrality line? Where to draw the threshold? That's the second thing. And the third thing is also when it comes to reporting, not just data, the role of narrative. Because one of the things we have seen many years is that if companies for some reasons have tended to a bit, a bit over report on non-material non issues, slightly under report on material issues. And so what is the role of the data? I think spending too much time on non-material, say storytelling and anecdotal narrative potentially is a thing of the past, whereas now it should be more contextual narrative that is supportive of the data you're wanting to explain. I think that's also quite helpful because data without narrative is incomplete. So one is the denominator, one is the denominator, they, they kind of feed onto each other. And I think so those three thing aspects, the parity, the metrality discussion, as well as the role of supporting supported narrative to the data is very important. Excellent. Matthew, your thoughts? Yeah, what comes to mind is, is, is start today. Um, this has already become a, a business as usual with 11,000 organizations using our standards, but many more globally. 90% uh, of the Fortune 500 produce some kind of report. Um, 60, uh, a global Fortune 500, about 70%. Um, so it's already there and driven today by elevated stakeholder expectations. Clearly, we're going to have a lot more organizations pulled into some of these um mandates that are coming out over 50,000 organizations will be affected by that. So it, it's already a business as usual, and it's going to have to elevate and professionalize that much more with some regulatory uh, things coming in the near future. Um, so you absolutely need to start today to meet those stakeholder expectations. But starting today also very much means looking around your organization where you are already. Uh, and Though it's a journey of a thousand steps, you're probably already taking uh, a number of them because uh, particularly with disclosure and reporting or data tracking, um, so much of what I've seen directly in sust on sustainability teams, but also working with reporters, this data sits with these different disciplines already in your organization, whether it's HR, tracking certain things, legal, environmental health and safety, certainly. So where it may feel like a Herculean task to start uh, getting in line to where the ex uh, stakeholder expectations are, it really is a process of sorting out what uh, have you done a materiality assessment yet on your impacts? What data is already being tracked? What's already cited as your biggest impacts that your organization actually or potentially has on the environment, economy, and society. Because like Mikkel uh, highlighted, uh, it's easier to identify financial materiality of things maybe in the short term. But going through that materiality process, which is outlined in the GRI standards, it helps you hotspot your biggest impacts and what your stakeholders care about. But that, of course, helps you identify the areas where you need to address that will 
become financially material because if you have exploitation of people or planet, that is bound to hit your bottom line. It's just a matter of when. So paying attention to your impacts, paying attention to your stakeholders and going through that process um, of reporting, which uh, can feel like uh, quite a feat, but it's not just for reporting sake. It is absolutely uh, helpful to the business is, is pretty key. So definitely start today if you haven't already begun. Uh, and continue to professionalize that if you have, because that's what's being called for by your stakeholders and by regulators. That's fantastic. I want to I want to start with saying thank you both for being here today and sharing your insights. I think um, it's important that organizations like Precisely and our focus on data integrity and master data management, you know, Matthew, the GRI, and your focus on understanding and establishing the standards and how people should be reporting and understanding that at a detail level. And then Mikkel, for you, bringing your capabilities and your insights and your expertise to help companies actually produce these highly consistent, accurate, and you know, contextually aware uh, constructs around their ESG reporting, it's really, really appreciated. So I wanna thank you for spending your time with us here today. I know that the audience got a lot out of this conversation and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you all and your organizations in the months to come.